Hi, uh, what I want to talk about now is the history of digital libraries, which uh, is actually more interesting than it sounds, I promise. Um, really, as much as anything, it's a, it's a story of the development of the Internet age and uh, the co-evolution, if you will, of technologies that we're familiar with. So, well, plus, I'm a big believer that if you want to understand where we are now, you have to understand how we got here. Um, plus, the history of digital libraries is interesting in the sense that it's kind of a tale of happy coincidences and of historical forces just sort of coming together nicely, um, the right place at the right time. So, to do this, topic justice, really, you have to go back to the origin of the internet in the late 1960s. But I'm not going to do that. Um, if you're interested, Michael Seidel um, at uh, Humboldt University in Berlin has developed a timeline of digital library history, and I'll provide a link to that. Um, that goes further back, all the way to the invention of the computer, and of course, there's the famous Hobbes Internet Timeline, and both of these make fascinating reading, and I would encourage you to go take a look at those. Uh, but for our purposes here, what I want to say is as early as the 1960s, mid-late 60s, libraries and other organizations, the government in particular, the military in particular, some of the wealthier business sectors, IBM, obviously, things like that. We're experimenting with databases. The first publicly available database was the ERIC database, which is an acronym that means or meant the Educational Resources Information Clearinghouse. Now I think the C stands for center, but whatever. Um, the ERIC database, which still exists and was first made available to the public in 1968. So the point is, very early on, we had databases, which are, of course, an enabling technology for digital libraries. So in the 70s on into the 80s, commercial scholarly publishers, ones that you're probably still familiar with in library land, were starting to experiment with electronic publishing. Uh, what that meant was publishers were starting to experiment with desktop publishing applications, so formatting electronically and then using that electronically formatted item as the original thing that gets disseminated rather than then putting that on paper. So some of these early experiments were disseminating materials on early networks, campus networks, and some of them were, by today's standards, quite laughable. They were disseminating materials on diskettes, on magnetic tape, on video disks even. Um, and uh, video disks were really cool. They're, you know, LP-sized CDs, basically. They're quite groovy nowadays. Um, the point is, pretty early on, earlier than you might expect, there, there were experiments in hashing out how to manage electronically published content. So, I've just glossed over 40 years of technology development in a couple of minutes. So, at this point, let's fast forward to 1991. In 1991 and 92, the National Science Foundation, the NSF, held three workshops, uh, which is a method that the NSF and other funding agencies often use to, to do brainstorming, organized brainstorming. What you do is you bring a bunch of really smart people together in a room together, and you, as the funding agency, choose those individuals to represent an area of, of research or development that you're particularly interested in. You get these people together to discuss the issues in that area and then set a research agenda or an action plan of some sort. 
So in 91-92, the NSF brings together researchers in areas such as database design and information retrieval and natural language processing and interface design and hypertext and knowledge representation and indexing, indexing and classification and some other areas. Basically, areas that we would now recognize as feeding into digital libraries, but which at the time were more or less independent research areas that didn't have a lot of cross-pollination between them. So the NSF brings all of these researchers together in all of these developing kind of cutting edge areas uh, to discuss how the NSF should go about supporting and funding research in these developing technological areas over the next five to ten years. Now understand that the NSF isn't acting on its own. The money to host these workshops and to fund the next five to ten years of technology development is coming from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. Um, DARPA is the the government agency that funded the development of the internet in the first place. Um, this money is coming from NASA, it's coming from the CIA, it's coming from other federal agencies. In other words, agencies that all saw early on what the potential and the possibilities of these technologies were for spinning out tools in fields like information retrieval, natural language processing, databases, etc. And I think when we fast forward 20 years, it's pretty obvious um, what you know the CIA thought was the potential of things like information retrieval and databases, right? We're seeing the fruits of that now with things like data mining and all of these issues. But at the time, this was a relatively new thing and they were just experimenting. So here we are in 1991-92 and the NSF, on behalf of all of these other agencies, is trying to set this five-year agenda. It gets all these researchers together. These researchers, some of whom are still active in the field today, um, these researchers quickly come to the conclusion that the best way to join forces and demonstrate the value of their research is to develop a universal library of some sort, something that can be a resource for K-12 education, college education, that can make use of databases, information retrieval tools, hypertext, etc., etc., some kind of electronic library. No, they didn't really like that term. Virtual library. No, that's not a very good term either because it implies that it's not really there. A digital library. Yeah, that sounds better. And so the term digital library was born. So here's happy coincidence number one. In the early 90s, computing technology is at a point when large-scale databases were just becoming viable. Prior to that, all that data would have required too large a hardware infrastructure, been too expensive to store. And, point number two, two, network technology was at a point where transferring large volumes of data was just becoming viable because network speeds were starting to pick up. Right? Prior to that, we had dial-up modems. And technologies like information retrieval and natural language processing and hypertext were getting advanced enough that it was becoming feasible to deploy them on large data stores. All these technologies were at a point where they could work together usefully, and that is just a happy accident of the technology development of the stage that all of those areas were at at the time. So now let me back up a few years to explain where all this money was coming from that the NSF was using to host these workshops and fund this five-year mission. In 1987, there was a stock market crash and a recession, followed by another recession in 1990 and 91. Economists and politicians were looking around, wondering what the hell was going on. Right? 
at that time, Germany and Japan were the main economic rivals to the United States in terms of manufacturing anyway. And the thinking was, at least some of the thinking, at the time was that Germany and Japan had done a better job than the U.S. had at integrating computing into all sectors of their economy. So in order to compete with Germany and Japan, we needed to do the same. Plus, we had the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and then we had the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1991. So what we're looking at here is a, a climate in which people are starting to think, well, the Cold War is over. We won. Maybe the military industrial complex is obsolete. How naive we were. But that was some of the thinking at the time. But the point is, there was this political will in Washington at that time to invest in basic research in computing and network technology in a way that honestly rarely happens. Now, you remember that quote that Al Gore gets made fun of, that he invented the internet? Yeah, well, that's not actually what he said. It's a misquote, but that doesn't matter because everybody remembers the misquote and not what he actually said. But anyway, that's what this is all about. I'm not gonna get into the political developments behind it because Frankly, that's really complicated the way politics always is. But in 1991, when Al Gore was still a senator from Tennessee, he introduced a bill that came to be known, not very creatively, as the Gore Bill. The Gore Bill led to the creation of the National High Performance Computing and Communications Initiative, which pushed a lot of funding towards research and development in network technology. In other words, it is in large part responsible for the boom in network technology in the 90s that led to the internet becoming a household word. So even though he gets made fun of for it, Gore wasn't completely wrong about the whole inventing the internet thing. The internet predates the 90s, goes back all the way to the late 60s and DARPA, as I just mentioned, but what pushed it into the forefront of you know, public awareness really was the Gore Bill in many ways. So, so the Gore Bill did a lot of things, but what we care about here for our purposes is that it identified digital libraries as one of four areas with, and I quote, broad and direct impact on the nation's competitiveness and the well-being of its citizens, unquote. So suddenly, here's this big pool of money appropriated for technology development, some of which is specifically targeted at enabling technologies for digital libraries, such as information retrieval and network development and infrastructure and et cetera, et cetera. So there's happy coincidence number two. In the early 90s, we had this political climate that's amenable to investing heavily in research in computing and ne network technology. Something that, let's face it, doesn't happen all that often. Often this is left for the private sector. So this is happening at a time when computing and network technology are coming together, as I talked about a minute ago, to enable large data stores to be manipulated and moved across global distances better than ever before. So there's your brief history of digital libraries, right? It's a tale of coincidences, almost too happy to be credible, right? The state of technology was just right for the politics of the day, or maybe vice versa, however you want to look at it. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs>